We live in a modern society that has come to demand and expect a pill for that. Whatever it is, we need a quick fix, a simple solution, a minimal effort task to solve our immediate health inconvenience. Or in other words, cover them up. However, I think it's worth everyone's time and energy to pause and ask, uh, how's that going? Which is exactly what we did in this video. And spoiler alert, not so good. Yo, 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 what is up? Welcome back to another week of How to Health. My name is Kevin. I run liftandbalance.com where we take aim at all things health and longevity and do it in an odd, weird, interesting, and highly sarcastic way. Today, we are exploring why magic pills don't seem to be the answer. That is, for getting the most out of our pretty cool meat suit for as long as possible. And we'll be doing it by looking at a plethora of data. Most importantly, wrapping up with what we should all probably seek doing instead. This powwow was inspired by a new paper published out of Penn State, which had some particularly bold predictions on some unsettling trends in Western society. And I'm not gonna lie, it brought out one of these. <sighs> As their analysis predicts that an American born in 2019 will spend a larger share of their lifetime taking prescription drugs than being married or possibly even working. Finding that current trend suggests that American males will spend approximately 48% of their lives taking prescription medications, and females will spend a whopping 60% of their lives taking them, which is just straight up wild. Especially since a minute 100 to 150 years ago, those numbers were basically zero. We literally started from the bottom, now we here. Shout out, Drake. Now, you may be thinking, wait a sec, aren't these magic pills a major reason for our increased average lifespan over the last century? And that would be somewhat true, as modern medicine has helped us mitigate two major issues that have traditionally dragged down those lifespan numbers infant mortality rate, and death by bacterial infection, which there's no denying was huge. But these feats have not necessarily increased our lifespan limits. Instead, they're simply allowing more people to reach their golden years, which again is awesome. That being said, as we fast forward to present day, the question remains, are we actually living healthier? Living into our seventh, eighth, and ninth decade of life, doing everything we love to do without any limitations? If we're being honest, it's hard to argue yes. And I'll tell you why. Research indicates that six out of 10 adults in the United States are currently dealing with one chronic disease. 60% of the population, and get this, four out of 10 or 40% are battling two or more chronic diseases. And that's just what's officially documented. Additional analyses suggest that upwards of 88% of the US adult population is suffering from metabolic dysfunction or impaired function of their cellular machinery, much of which being undiagnosed and untreated. If you're looking for an example of this, a common culprit is the silent dysfunction associated with insulin resistance, ultimately creating a modern person who is a tired, lethargic, low energy, sore, achy, sad, moody, depressed, less intelligent walking ape because of it. Blaming it all on the societal primed excuse of, that's just what happens when you get old. Sounds kind of familiar, right? And because of this, our collective health spans or years that we are truly healthy has been decreasing compared to a pretty stagnant average lifespan, with research suggesting that the average person spends upwards of the last 20% of their lives in a state of morbidity or a state of being diseased. So it would seem this magic pill revolution really isn't the secret to vitality over time at least in this moment of history. In fact, 
data suggests that the more prescription pills that an individual takes, the worse off their health outcomes usually are. Now, to be clear, this is not to say that medications are not life-saving and haven't progressed society. They most certainly can be and have. This is simply asking, are we missing a more effective solution? A solution which may be hiding right under our nose this whole time. And if you've been around this channel, I think you know what I think. So let's explore. And why not start with a question? If magic pills are not the best option when it comes to modulating our cellular and metabolic self to operate more efficiently, then what is? Well, the OG pharmaceuticals, of course. As we argue in this video here, the reason pharmaceutical drugs work in the first place is because they tap into already existing systems and pathways which have been ingrained in our biology for millions of years. And this feeling good, refreshed, restored, rejuvenated thing is really just a function of putting our biological machinery in a position to do its thing aka operate efficiently. And wouldn't you know it, despite all of the rapid advancements in modern medicine, the two most powerful modulators of our biochemical and physiological self happens to be lifestyle and environment. And we need look no further than those world famous blue zones or distinct pockets of the world where people not only live extraordinarily long, but extraordinarily healthy as well. Being active, mobile, social, and in good cognitive health into their hundredth year and beyond. With two documented examples, the Okinawa in Japan and Sardinians in Italy, having substantially lower pharmaceutical use when compared to non-centenarian controls from other regions. Instead, these populations deploy medicine through lifestyle, staying active, eating real whole nourishing foods, prioritizing social connections, keeping good circadian alignment and interacting with nature. With that, let's take a look at some examples of this quite interesting lifestyle pill, with the first stop being activity levels. An international study led by the University of Granada has provided the first scientific proof for how many daily steps one should take to significantly reduce the risk of premature death, landing on the magic number of 8,000. This is partly because every time we badonkadonk, we upregulate the secretion of bioactive compounds, which boost metabolic function, improve mood, strengthen our mitochondria, clean up cellular damage, lower inflammation, reduce stress, strengthen our structural self, AKA bones and muscles, prime the brain for learning, upregulate our natural detoxification processes, and, this is an important one, increasing our odds, likelihood, and probability of looking cool naked. You thought I was gonna say something else, didn't you? Pretty damn good resume if you ask me. But what about that food stuff everyone likes talking about? Let's explore a recent study from the Empirical School of Public Health. Here, researchers analyzed data on the diets of 200,000 middle-aged adults, finding that higher consumption of ultra-processed foods was associated with a greater overall risk of developing cancer, observing that for every 10% increase of these foods in a person's diet, there was a 2% increase in developing some form of cancer, and a 6% increased risk of mortality from cancer. This is likely due to the energy dense, nutrient scarce composition of these foods, lacking proper macro and micronutrient balance, phytonutrient profiles, and fiber, which play such an important role in cellular and metabolic health, all the way down to the primal energy producing organelles, which we love to talk about so much because they're so important, are mitochondria. And might I add the trillions of microbes living within, which happen to be directly cultivated by the foods we eat. And as we've discussed in previous reviews, 
which will be linked below, these microbes and their diversity status have an impact on our longevity. With a more diverse community typically associated with a longer, healthier life and a depleted, unbalanced community, the unfortunate status quo for the average person today associated with the opposite. Moral of the story, food matters and not prioritizing real whole nourishing ones will drastically tilt one's odds towards morbidity. Speaking of morbidity, our increasingly poor relationship with sleep isn't helping the cause. As staying up late into the wee hours of the night, depriving ourselves of adequate circadian aligned sleep or an eight hour sleep opportunity aligned with the day night cycles of this beautiful floating rock is being shown to be one of the fastest ways to disrupt every single system in our body. A great example of this is shift work or a job which has an individual frequently working when they should be naturally sleeping has been identified by health overseeing bodies as a probable carcinogen, AKA something that causes cancer. And get this, Recent research has displayed that this phase shift alters hormones in animals which increase stress, appetite, and the desire for those ultra-processed foods, which certainly does not help the longevity cause. So prioritizing going to bed and waking up at the same time each and every day, even on the weekends, giving yourself an eight hour sleep opportunity between the hours of 8 p.m. and 10 a.m., getting natural light in the morning and limiting artificial light exposure in the evening, eating during the day and fasting overnight, staying active, cutting off caffeine by noon, and creating a solid sleep hygiene routine, all topics we have elaborate deep dives on which will be linked below, is a lifestyle endeavor pretty damn worth pursuing. Finally, the last modulator that we must talk about is nature. Because it just so happens, as this wave of disease and dysfunction continued to rise over the preceding decades, our time outdoors did the exact opposite. With research suggesting that most people currently spend nearly 90% of their lives indoors shielded from the elements and environment in which their biology evolved for hundreds of thousands of homo sapien years and millions of primate years. And bam, just like that, in a span of a century or two, we are not only interacting less with nature, but we're also insulated from the earth and its bioelectric neutralizing effects. There's a reason why a stubbornly high amount of research on the topic has concluded that going outside, getting some sun, touching some earth, and breathing some fresh air universally improves mood, cognition, alertness, energy levels, physical function, and even sleep later that night. And that's interesting, but it goes even deeper than that. Nature has even been shown to change the structure of our brain. As a small yet elaborate study following and scanning the brains of humans for eight months found that more time outside was associated with an increase of gray matter in key cognitive areas of the brain, indicating more connectivity and communication between these key regions. Damn is right. A combo, might I add, that would take an elaborate cocktail of pharmaceuticals to even attempt, with the potential side effects likely being absolutely wild, which, in my view, makes settling on a life, which standardize on habits which ultimately make you dependent on pharmaceuticals for 50 plus percent of your life, wild too. The goal, at least the way I view it, is to never get to that point in the first place is to build the habits, routines, and rituals that allow you to experience how you're capable of feeling effing awesome naturally. And that is achieved through owning it. Putting your biological machinery, which has evolved precisely over millions of years, in a position to do its thing. Because this current pharma trend we're on here is clearly not your friend. Leaving the decision up to you. Break it or slowly allow it to break you. Easy choice if you ask me.